people don't get answers to prayer, it simply all boils down to this very simple. You ask wrong. People don't get answers to prayer because they ask you wrong. And when I say ask you wrongly, I don't necessarily mean in the content of what you say. Because there are a lot of people that know exactly how to say it, but the manner in which they say it is wrong, or the action behind it is wrong, you know, uh, or they're not in the right position to ask. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's like me uh, asking someone to lend me $500, and I already owe them $10,000. There wasn't nothing wrong with my asking. It was just my position. <laughs> I'm already not in right standings with that person because I'm already in debt to them. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, uh, so when we say asking wrongly, you know, it goes more than just what you say or how you say it. Sometimes it's, it's in your actions. Your actions could be coming... You could be coming from a wrong place from an action standpoint, you know. So uh, we've been talking about prayer, and, and I hope that you, that you guys have been learning something and taking this in. Because, again, this is my bread and butter right here. You know, we, we've been talking on Sunday mornings about, you know, the kingdom of God. And, you know, and, 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 and probably for the rest of my life, I'm going to be talking about the kingdom of God or things that pertain to the kingdom. And when we're talking about prayer, it pertains to the kingdom. So see, I'm actually talking about the kingdom of God even on tonight, but we're talking about it from a prayer standpoint, things that pertain to the kingdom. Last time we were here, we talked about, uh, what prayer was that? What prayer did we talk about the last time? For those of you that were here. <laughs> huh? The prayer of faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'll tell you what, you know, sometimes when I'm up teaching and preaching, some things come out of my mouth that even shock me. You know, and something that I said on last last week was about, and, 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 and why I took that home and I took it to heart. Because I had said it before, but I didn't necessarily see it until I said it last Wednesday night. And you say, well, what was that? Well, I, I said something to the, this uh, uh, effect. That for the most part, the reason why the devil tri trips us up when it comes to operating in faith is because he tells us we are doubting. Because doubts are always in our head. Well, and, you know, there, there is no time the way you're going to try to go to act on the word of God which you will not have doubt in your head. And because the doubts are going on in our heads, they will tell us, see, you're not in faith, you're in unbelief. Because, listen, now, look at all that doubt that you got in your head. You doubt whether God is doing it. You doubt whether you're healed. You doubt whether God hurt you. I mean, you know, and your mind will. That's what scripture said. Trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart. Heart and lean not into your own understanding, which is your mind. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I got a lot. I don't know about you, but I, that just, I got a lot out of that last Wednesday. I say, so basically, Lord, what you're saying, yes, I'm telling you that 100% of the time when you go to stand on the word of God, your head is going to experience doubt. See? Because your head only operates and works with what it knows. See? And, and if it can't see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, or hear it, you know, the head will say, I doubt it. See, I doubt it. It only goes by what it knows. And there's a lot of things that your head do not know. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So we talked about the prayer of faith on last week. That was that point. I'm telling you what, it's just getting good and good. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Good and good. Just getting good and good. Tonight, we're going to talk about the prayer of intercession. The prayer of intercession. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And uh, again, I hope you're keeping your little hand out because I'm making these out for, uh, up for you so that you can... Uh, Follow along and, and go home and do some research and study. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The prayer of intercession. Just prefacing this by saying this, start off by saying this, and talking about, again, I'm, I'm, I'm still kingdom of God minded, and talking about the kingdom of God. Do you know the most powerful person in the world, or on the earth, is the intercessor? He or she is the most powerful person in the mind of God, the intercessor is the most powerful person on the earth. 
Get this. Now this may bake your noodle right here. They are also the most rewarded in heaven. Not the big time evangelist. Not the big time apostle. Not the prophet. Not the pastor that had the mega church. The most rewarded person in heaven is going to be the intercessor. Why? Because without him or her, it wouldn't be no big time evangelist. It wouldn't be no big time pastor. And it wouldn't be no Mr. Or Pro apostle or prophet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. They all owe it to the intercessor. And so, I mean, you know, I know I can see, a, uh, you know, some of these pastors of these mega churches, you know, getting ready to receive a big old mountain of reward. And God going to say, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> that belongs to a mama right here. You know, the one that came to prayer all the time you had to church when she prayed it from the storefront to the size that it was. So I'm sorry, but that all goes to mama. Amen. Oh, my. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The most powerful person on the earth is the intercessor and the most rewarded person in heaven would be the intercessor. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I'll I tell you what, just, uh, 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 I love being an intercessor, and, and we're going to really actually get off into talking about this, exactly what an intercessor is. So if you have your little hand out there, let's start off with Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, but we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Then verse 27, And he that searcheth the heart, knoweth what is the mind of his Spirit, listen to this, because he maketh what? Intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Your prayers could be the difference, think about it now, your prayers could be the difference between life and death, heaven or hell, deliverance or bondage for someone. Your prayers can. And I understand, again, remember when we was talking on Sunday uh, about the uh, uh, releasing the power of the kingdom, and we talked about praying and dealing with the unknown, and how that God is going to hold us accountable for, uh, when I say us, I'm talking about the children of the kingdom. He's going to hold us accountable for what's going on in the earth, whether we knew it or, or, or not. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. No, it, it, it's up to us to do something about this. Ah, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who? Speak. My people. He didn't say if the government. He didn't say if the governor. He didn't say if the president. He didn't say if the senator. He didn't say if the school teachers. He didn't say if the police department. He didn't say, he said if my people. And, and, and just in case we don't understand my people, he went a little further and said, which are called by my name. That's okay, now you know what he's talking about. If my people, which are called by my name, if we would do something, if we would do something, then he will hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. So the responsibility of this city, state, and nation rests squarely upon the shoulders of the church in the church of the kingdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, I mean, you know, God was going to hold the church accountable. We're thinking, you know, I'll tell you what, God going to get that president. Look at what he's doing. God going to get this guy over uh, in, in North Korea. Look at what he's doing. God going to get, uh-uh-uh. <laughs> no, ma'am, no, sir. The responsibility rolls upon the church. You say, but I didn't know anything about it. Doesn't matter. You have the Holy Ghost. And he knows all. See, doesn't matter. You have the Holy Ghost and he knows all. You should have worked with him. I sent him down there to help you. You have no excuse. I gave you the Holy Ghost. I gave you my name. I gave you my word. You have no excuse. I gave you my authority. You have no excuse. You have no excuse. And so while the church is sitting back, you know, just waiting on the judgment of God to fall on all these heathens and unbelievers, it's going to fall, but not what they think. <laughs> it's going to fall in the church first. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, uh, uh, again, you... Have the, uh, uh, now get this, let's, uh, I, 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 it's almost hard for me to separate this kingdom thing from this. Get this, you have a power, Mr. and Mrs. Believer, on the inside of you. And because of that power you have on the inside of you, you can make a difference in somebody else's life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You see, understand this. Man, there are some people who will... They 
so let's say they were just raised in, a, in, in the church with their family. And, and, and it was easy for them to accept Christ. Maybe even as a little girl, maybe even as a little boy. It was easy for them to accept Christ. You know, but there are some, hear me now, and hear the heart of God and the heart of the Holy Spirit. There are some out there that the only way they're going to make heaven is that somebody bring them or bring them in. That's the only way they're going to, somebody is going to have to step up and bring them in. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There are some who would hear the word of God and accept their salvation and be saved. There are some who would hear the word of God and accept their healing and be healed. There are some who would hear the word of God and accept their deliverance and be delivered. There are some who will hear the word of God and get their miracle. There are some who will hear the word of God and learn how to flow in their ministry and so forth. But then on the other hand, there are some who would never do that unless you pray. Yes, they got all the tools. Yes, they have all the potential. But they will not make it in or they will not get healed or they will not get delivered or they will not flow in their ministry or they will not be able to obey God and come out of their bondage unless the intercessor works with the Holy Spirit and begin to pray for them. See, likewise, the Spirit also help it. The Holy Ghost helps us. He's our helper. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, you know, we was talking a little bit about the unknown before we preached and talked about this. You see, what we don't understand and what the church is missing and what the world is even missing, that uh, 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 when we see something going on and something happening from a natural standpoint, all we'll sing is the tip of the iceberg. And we try to pray for what we see and what we know, which is just the tip of the iceberg. But the bigger problem is that 90% that's under the water that you do not see and that you do not know. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may see me struggling, and you may see me going through, and you say, Bro, Brother Foster, and Pastor is really struggling, and Pastor is really going through, I'm going to pray. Well, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're only seeing 10%. You're not seeing the other 90% that's really causing all the problem. See, that's the way it is. I mean, you know, so when we look at a circumstance or situation, and we think, you know, oh, my God, you know, they really suffer and go... No, ma'am, no, sir. We're only getting, from what we can gain from a knowledge standpoint, it's only probably about 10% of the problem. 90% of the problem is kind of like that iceberg is hid under the water. You do not see. That's why we need the help of the Holy Ghost to pray. See? So when somebody comes to you and say, pray for me, girl, I'm really going through. Trust me, it's much more than what they're telling you. See, and sometimes the reason why the Word of God don't work, and sometimes the reason why we are not successful it's because we're only praying for what we know. What about that we do not know? Hmm? See? What about that we do not know? Uh, uh, you know, well, I done laid hands on her. I done laid hands on him. I've known him with all. I've got this person praying, that person, so forth, so And he's saying for whatever reason, he's still not getting it. Maybe something is going on behind the scenes that's constantly adding to that and feeding into that that you don't know anything about. That's why we need the intercession. That's what we need, uh, the, the people that will get over in the spirit and begin to pray and to make intercessions on behalf of other people, places, and things. See, again, we are, and, and, and I, th I like Romans 8, 26, because it calls it a, 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 a weakness. We, we do have a weakness. Can anybody tell me what our weakness is? Huh? Not knowing. Ignorance. There it is. You see, we are dealing in a realm that's actually ran by a bigger realm. It's ran by a realm we can't see. It's ran by a dimension we can't see. That puts us at a disadvantage. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Because what we think we're praying for is not what we need to be praying for. That puts us at a disadvantage. That's why we must rely on, and that's why we must depend upon the Holy Ghost. Because without Him, I don't know, I mean, you know, again, you know, the frustration, our frustration is that we think we're working it and doing what the Word says, but we forget about all of that we don't know. And that's the problem. I remember that one guy that was upset with me because 
you know, I, I, I was saying all you have to do is have faith and believe and know the word of God. And, you know, and you, you'll be healed. He said, well, don't tell me my daddy didn't know it. Don't tell me. I, I know my daddy and his daddy died of cancer. Don't tell me my daddy wasn't. He was a believer. He was faithful. He was in the church for years. And, and don't tell me he didn't, he didn't believe the word of God. I know he had faith. I know he had faith. And then I told him, I said, brother, I trust you and believe that your daddy had faith and did believe. But maybe he believed all he knew to believe. What about all of that he did not know that he should have been believing? You see, a lot of times it's not what people know that trips them up. It's what they don't know. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, I mean, uh, again, you know, uh, it, there's a frustration here on our part. My frustration is, is that a lot of times what I think I'm praying for is not necessarily what I need to be praying for. And, 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 and so, so how am I going to get help with this? I mean, you know, how am I gonna, God is expecting me to get results. God's expecting you to get results. So what are we going to do? How are we going to get help here? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Was like only one way. Likewise, the Spirit also helping our infirmity or weaknesses, for we know not. Now, see, the, the weakness is our lack of knowledge, for we know not, for we know not. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I'm, I'm saying all that to say this, because in order to be an effective intercessor, you can't be moved by what you see. And in order to be an effective intercessor, you got to know that what you see is not really the problem. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wish I could get that over to members, not the pastor. Because a lot of times, you know, they come to me, <laughs> it, 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 really, it tickled me because they come to me and, they, you know, pastor, I know what my problem is. No, you don't. Now, y'all didn't know you don't. Yes, no, you don't. I know what my problem is. No, you don't. If you knew what your problem was, you'd been affected by now, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, you, you keep coming and saying, you know what your problem is. No, you, you think you know what your problem is. And, 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 and I laugh because a lot of times, even while they tell me what they think their problem is, they way off in left field. <laughs> way off in left field. Like, no, you don't really know what your problem is. And, and a lot of times, if people can come humbly like that and say, Preacher, I really wish you could tell me what's going on and what I can do, do, do the, as opposed to coming and saying, I know what my problem is. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what your problem is. Is it, that hard head man. <laughs> oh, okay, moving right along. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, remember the story of Lazarus? Uh, look over that. Look at that. Uh, John eleven thirty nine through forty four. Jesus said, "Take ye away the stone." Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, "Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days." Jesus said unto her, "Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shalt see the glory of God?" Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead, now get this, verse 44. And he that was dead, came forth, bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, here it is, loose him, and let him go. Jesus said unto who? Jesus said unto who? Well, Jesus raised him, why come he didn't do it? <laughs> but he said unto them, it is your responsibility. You release him, and you let him go. This passage of scripture here concerning the raising of Lazarus from the dead is a perfect picture of intercession and the power of it. Notice that Jesus raised him from the dead, but he told his disciples to release him and let him go. Only Jesus has the power to raise the spiritual dead. Notice uh, Ephesians 2 and 1. And ye had he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were all dead in our sins until Jesus called us out of the tomb of spiritual death. Remember that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But just like Lazarus, we all came out of the tomb bound from head to toe with grave clothes or things associated with spiritual death. See, I don't know about you, 
But when I got born again, I still had great clothes on. Uh, yeah, when I got born again, I still had great. I, I still was wrestling with the nicotine habit. I was still wrestling with smoking that wacky back in the day. <laughs> and my pastor would always say, you know, you know you're putting drugs in your vein and no sense in your brain. Yeah. <laughs> but I was dealing with, I, I still had grave clothes on. You know, I, I, I still was cursing like a sailor. You know, I mean, you know, just, see, a lot of people seem to think that when you get saved that you stop doing all that stuff. Well, well see, I, I got proof right here. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but he still had grave clothes. See, see people, they get, they get saved and deliverance mixed up. They think they're the same thing. No, there are many people that they're, they're saved, but they still need deliverance. Anybody know somebody like that? Yeah, they're saved, but they still need deliverance. A uh, uh, Lazarus was alive, but he still needed deliverance. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, often you had to get saved, and when you got saved, you just, you stopped everything. You know I mean, you, did, you didn't drink no more, you didn't curse no more, you didn't lie no more, you didn't cheat no more. Come on. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. You ain't your hands, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean because with, with me, I mean you know, I mean because now we do have those people that you know they they are they have those holier than thou's that you know they 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 expect that when you get saved you're gonna quit doing all of that stuff that you were doing. No, Mister and Mrs. Believe, you got to understand this body was on a runaway course, sinning and doing everything it thought it was big and bad enough to do. Now I got saved. Now you think the body gonna say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna sit down and be nice? No. <laughs> I mean, my body took me in the conference. It said, wait a minute, let's talk about this same thing. <laughs> I about to say, wait a minute, let's talk about this same thing now. Then nobody asked me about this. You went up there, but before you know it, he called him, and, you know, he made the appeal, and you went up there, and you didn't ask me anything about that. You know, so when they got back home, said, so can I please, hey, go in there and get my mirrors that I got in the refrigerator. <laughs> I, I did have some, <laughs> you know, and, and this was my mindset, Lord, you know, let me finish this off, and, you know, then I'm going to be saved, <laughs> no, but that's another story, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you know, when, when people, when they get saved, you know, I mean, they're still dealing with great clothes, things associated with spiritual death, thank you, Lord Jesus, now get this, like I said, this is a perfect picture of intercession, get this, Lazarus was alive, but he could not help himself. See, I told you there are some people, they are spiritually alive, they are children of the kingdom, but the only way they're going to get free is somebody's going to have to help them. See? The only way they're going to get healed, somebody's going to have to help them. The only way they're going to get delivered, somebody's going to have to help them. The only way they're going to get out of that situation, somebody's going to have to help them. Only Jesus has the power to raise the spiritually dead back to life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But when he raised them back to life, he says to his disciples, now you see what the responsibility is. Get this, the responsibility was not on Lazarus. Why is it that a lot of times we put it back on the person that's bound? You're going to hell in a gasoline suit. You're still doing that mess and going to church. You ain't nothing but a hypocrite. Now see, you put it back on the person. Hello. See, you put it back on the person. Jesus didn't say, okay, now Lazarus, you lose yourself and let yourself go. He didn't. He put the responsibility on the disciples. He said, now you release him and let him go. He didn't even accept the responsibility of it. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to release him and let him go. No. He put it back on the disciples. He said, now you release him and let him go. See, that's intercession there. There are some people that are so bound with grave clothes or things that are so associated with spiritual death that except they have an intercessor, there is no way they're going to be free. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so as church folks and church members, we shouldn't talk about them and we shouldn't ostracize them from the church and call them all kinds of names and hypocrites and stuff just because it seems like they can't get free of their grave clothes. It's not their responsibility. You see, Paul said something to this extent over in Galatians. He said, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again into Christ be formed in you. Wait a minute. When did he travail the first time? When he gave birth to them in Christ. 
See, my little children, of whom I travail at birth and birth again into Christ before many you. You see, there's a lot of people that have been born again into the kingdom, but Christ has not been formed in them yet. And until we travail so that Christ can be formed on the inside of them, they're still going to have problems with their grave clothes, and they're still going to have problems with the world. Still going to have problems with that. And you see, maybe that's the reason why come some, some church folks are still wearing grave clothes. What, 10, 15, 20 years old in the Lord, and you still got grave clothes on. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Maybe because somebody didn't step up and do what they were supposed to do. And I don't know about you, but I, 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 I was like this. And I'm still like this. I hate to see church folks talking about people that have problems and shortcomings, and they don't do anything about it. Listen, you have the power. To this. Jesus said to the disciples, you release him and let him go. You have the power. Something like the Lord told me. He said, you know, if, if they would talk to me about that person, instead of going around and talking to everybody else about that person, I'd have them set free by now. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. See, we want to get on the telephone <laughs> and call up Sister Bucket Mouth. Come on, somebody, you know, and, and just start running our mouth. Hello. And then as a result, as a result, I mean, you know, the person, you know, they just, it, that frustrated me. I mean, you know, you, you talked about me and my, you don't know what I'm going through. Again, what you think the problem is ain't number 10% of what the problem is. There's a whole 90% that you do not see. So even when we see people out there struggling and going through, you may think you know what the problem is, but you don't. The Holy Ghost knows everything. Hallelujah. That's good, isn't it? Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, the reason why some never receive is because those who have been freed have not taken the time to release them and let them go. Instead of spending precious time in prayer and intercession for them, the church has elected to talk about and ostracize them. Notice in the story of Lazarus that he could not free himself. As a matter of fact, Jesus seemed to have placed the burden of deliverance on his disciples and, la and, and uh, on his disciples, not Lazarus, not even himself. Until we understand this principle, there will be many who will never receive God, even though they have been born again in our blood-washed child of God. Mm, thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, in the case of Lazarus, it was a case of deliverance from, bondage, from the bondage of the flesh. But there are also those who will never receive healing, Never receive peace of mind or from mental bondage. Never receive financial well-being. Never receive deliverance from demonic or uh, or possession or oppression. Until someone has delivered or taken it upon themselves to free them through intercessory prayer and soul travail. This is solely your responsibility. It's not on the Lord. And he gave us the power to bind and loose. Remember that over in Matthew 18, 18 to 21? Whatsoever you... Who? Who? You. Say, you means me. I'm going to say it again. You means me. See? Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again, if I'll send you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that who shall ask. Did you, now, did you get that? See, a lot of times when we pray in the prayer of agreement, we're trying to pray the prayer of agreement, you know, basically for ourselves. But Actually, the prayer agreement, in, in text or in context, actually the prayer agreement is a prayer of intercession. That if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. See? That they shall ask. But a lot of times, you know, when people come up, we, we do the uh, united prayer thing with each other. You know, like I'm praying, somebody come up and pastor, uh, agree with me. Well, okay, that's fine, and we can do that. But actually, you know, if you want to keep that in its, its context, it's actually talking about them. Not us. Not the ones that, that are agreeing. You see that? Thank you, Lord. Uh, John 15, 16. If any man see his brother, here it is again, sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and give him life for them that sin not unto death. Now, that is so powerful right there. Because to me, it sounded like he's saying... If you see me doing the wrong thing, or if you see me cutting and strutting, <laughs> if you see me messing up, if you prayed for me, you can get deliverance for me. 
as opposed to talking about me and lowering me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I remember the Lord telling me this once, you know, when uh, my mother, you know, I'm thoroughly convinced she was born again, but, you know, when she, uh, she had Alzheimer's, and her condition deteriorated to the point to where she, of course, you know, they say Alzheimer's is the, uh, the long kiss goodbye because, you know, people, the mental status just dwindles away, you know. And, 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 and my mother, she would not even take the medication, so she went fast. You know, and she got to the point of where she could not uh, recognize us, no family members, you know. And, and uh, uh, we'd always, you know, somebody spend time by her bedside and so forth and so on like that. So uh, I'm by her bedside and I'm praying. I'm going like, you know, well, Lord, I, I don't know if my own, you know, I know she was born again and, and child of God, but I don't know if she ever got back to you and so forth like that. He said, well, why don't you pray and ask me to forgive her? I say, you say, what? He say, remember that scripture where I said, if any man see his brother sin a sin that is not unto death, he shall ask, and I would and, and I would give them life. He says, why don't you pray and ask for me to forgive her? Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, you mean I can do that even though she's not in it? He said, yes. See, that's what that scripture is saying right there. Remember something? I said, people don't understand. You don't understand that you have power to remit sins. You do understand that, don't you? Remember when he told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? He said, whosoever sins you retain, they shall be retained. And whosoever sins you remit, remit means to remove. They shall be removed. <laughs> See, this is why we're going to get in trouble. Oh, I said, we are talking about the church. This is why we're going to get in trouble with God because we're going around saying God going to get you for that, and God going to get you for that, and God going to get you for that, well, God going to say, no, you should have been praying for their salvation. You should have been praying for their sins. See, you released them and let them go. You released them and let them go. You released them and let them go. Thank you, Lord Jesus. No, I mean, if the church would only if, if remember that one law of love and walk in love. See, because, again, there are some people, I, I, the Lord kind of continue to say that, there are some people that can't help themselves. The devil has them in such a way. Deep down in their heart, they know they're wrong. Deep down in their heart, they know they got to get right. But for some reason, they can't seem to get out of that bondage. That's where you and I come in. See, that's where you and I come in. Mm. See, the, the, this is why I told I, I, Remember what I said at the top of this teaching? The intercessor is the most powerful person in the world. When it comes to the kingdom of God, this man right here, this woman right here is the most powerful, the innocent. Thank you, Lord Jesus. They carry a lot of power with God. Trust me when I tell you, they carry a lot of power with God. You don't believe that? I'm going to show you. Look at me. I said they carry a lot of power with God. You don't believe me? I'm going to show you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. First, let me give you the definition of the word intercede. To act or interpose in behalf of someone in difficulty or trouble. Ooh, I like that. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> As by pleading or petition. My God, you can't even get any better than that. Intercession, uh, uh, intercede by definition. To attempt to reconcile differences between two people or groups. Intercessor, by definition. Plead for somebody. Intercession or intercede by definition, act between between parties with a view to reconciling differences. Speak of somebody, meditate in a in a in a dispute, intervene, negotiate, act as a mediator. Boy, that's some powerful definitions right there. Talking about in, to the intercede. Now I'm gonna show you this power that an intercessor has. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Look at Ezekiel. 22, 29 through 31. The people of the land had used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Oh, here it is right here. And I sought for a man. He didn't seek, he didn't seek for a group. He didn't seek for a church. He didn't seek for a gang. He said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge 
in standing the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God said, I, I, I was just looking for one person. He was looking for the intercessor. I was just looking for one person. And that one person was going to stand between me and the land. And if I could have found that one person, I wouldn't destroy the land. Or my wrath wouldn't have came upon the land. If I'd have found one person. See, I told you, you're powerful. If I'd have found one person. Thank you, Lord Jesus. See that? When people sit up and talk about, and, 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 and I, I just, you know, you, you ever heard that saying before, you know, you know, uh, Sometimes, you know, people, you know, you think people stupid until they open their mouth and then you know they are. <laughs> I mean, you know, because when, when people when people start talking about, you know, how God going to do this and this is going to rain down on America and this is going to happen to America and so forth, I said, no, it ain't. It's how, you know, I said, because I am here. <laughs> to one person, <laughs> because I am here. That's why it ain't going to happen to America, because I, now if I leave, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I am here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 remember the Apostle Paul. And God has given me these illustrations. Remember the Apostle Paul and, and the, the group that, you know, when they, they, they had him in, in chains and they took a, took a ship to, uh, 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 where is it? Ooh, they going, took a ship to Rome. They took a ship to Rome. And this uh, a storm arose, Eurachlodon, this hurricane, this typhoon arose. And the angel of the Lord stood before Paul and said, not only are you going to survive, Paul, but because you, you are on this ship, everybody else on the ship is going to be saved because you on the ship. One person saved the whole ship. See, I feel like that when I step on an airplane. <laughs> Like y'all, don't worry about it now. <laughs> this this, this plane is all right. You okay? Y'all okay? Like this one one little girl, uh, one old woman. You know, she was uh, for her first time flying, and, and they was having a pretty hard time trying to keep her calm. You know, because she's wanting to get off the airplane. You know, no, 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 no. Let me get off. Let me get off. Let me get off. And all of a sudden, she comes out and saying, "Okay, don't worry about it." And they wonder what happened to her. Why she just all of a sudden get calm? And she say, "What?" You're not afraid? Of this? And she said, not anymore. I said, why not? Because he stepped on the plane. It was Oral Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow. laughs> when she saw Oral Roberts step on the plane, she said, I know it ain't going down now. <laughs> so there was some truth to that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. No, I, I, uh, intercessors are powerful people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. They're powerful. Look over at Numbers. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm, I'm going to read all of this to you all, man. Y'all can read along with me. Numbers. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses, or murmured against the pastor. Mm -hmm. Be careful that you don't murmur against the pastor. Mm -hmm. Don't y'all talk about me now? <laughs> don't talk about me. Uh, they murmured against uh, Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation, hmm, thank you, Lord Jesus. You're not going to talk about that. Uh, this right here, you know, I'm, 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 I'm reading over kind of lightly and just kind of brushing it off. But people don't realize that they take years off of their life a lot of times when they, uh, talking against men or women of God. I tell you, I've learned this from the Lord. The greater the anointing and the greater the call, the swifter the judgment. Remember uh, Miriam and Aaron when they got upset with Moses because he married a black woman. It was an Ethiopian woman. She was black. And they got upset with him because he had married a black woman. Moses didn't even know anything about it, but they behind his back talking it, and he just gave them this face to every day. What in the world was he thinking? And they were talking. And then all of a sudden, all of them heard the voice of the Lord. Miriam, Aaron, Moses, get over to the tabernacle of the congregation quick, right now. I want to see you. And they got there. 
And and Moses going like, y'all know what's going on? Why are you calling us? You know, and they going, I don't know. And they got over to the top of the congregation and the cloud of the Lord appeared. And God said, he said, listen, if there is a prophet among you or a dream of dream, I will reveal myself to him through dreams or in vision. But my servant Moses is not so. Moses is my friend. I don't talk to him in dreams and I don't talk to him in visions. I talk to Moses face to face. And since you all know that, why is it you weren't afraid to talk to God and put your mouth on it? And it was right while the Lord was speaking, Miriam turned as white as she. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And, and Moses being meek and smiling, he'll say, God, heal her now, God. God say, if her father so much as spit in her face, wouldn't she be unclean for seven days? God said, she's going to stay outside the camp for seven days in that condition for what she did. Never then, you can tell that Miriam was the one that instigated it. <laughs> Thank you. I just, again, I just, I just wanted to stop and share that. I mean, I just, the, the Holy Ghost arrested me. I was trying to go on. <laughs> but again, people don't understand. Uh, see, Moses was a powerful man of God. I, I, I knew this powerful man of God down in Arkansas. Uh, people that talked about him and put their mouth on him, bad things happened to him. Well, I mean, even to this day, he, he done got off a little bit. But I still won't put my mouth on him. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of almost like David, you know. Uh, uh, he's God's anointed. Don't I mean, you know, he may be off, but he's still God's anointed. He may be off, but he's still God's anointed. That's what David did when it comes to Saul. And then the guy that thought that, you know, that David's going to reward him because he lied and said that he killed Saul. David flew around and killed him. Say, so how is it that you wasn't afraid to lift your hands toward God's anointed? Okay, okay. Now I'm moving on. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That was free. Didn't cost you nothing. Just threw it in. Uh, verse 43. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a census. Now see, God just said, Leave the congregation. And he said, You know, I'm just, I'm just going to I'm going to consume them all. You just, just leave the country. Moses already knew what was going on. <laughs> and, Mo and Moses and Aaron, uh, let me see. And Moses said to Aaron, he said, listen, take a censer. How many know what a censer is? It's just a thing that has incense in it. Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put uh, on incense and go quickly into the congregation and make an atonement for them. For the, now, now get this, go well, quickly into the congregation and make an atonement for them. Now we're talking about two and a half million people here. One person. I want you to, you know, get your censer and put, get fire from off the altar. And I want, I want you to go and, 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 and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath going out from the Lord. Listen to this. The plague has begun. The plague has begun. Take a look around you, firstborn. The plague has begun. Even among members of this church, the plague has begun. Can't you see it? Can't you see it? Your own family, the plague has begun. Can't you see it? In our city, the plague has begun. In this nation, the plague has begun. God needs somebody to go in the midst of the congregation to take a coal off the altar. He needs you to take a coal off the altar and go and stand in the midst of the people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so that the plague can be stayed. This is what we call a gap standard. The intercessor is a gap standard. You see, here's the gap right here. Here's God. Here's the person that needs God. The intercessor stands in the gap and he hold, takes a hold of God and he takes over a person that needs God. See? Uh, this is what the intercessor does. This, here's God. Here's the nation. This is what the intercessor does. Here's God. Here's the church. This is what the intercessor does. Here's God. Here's the family. This is what the intercessor does. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, are you getting this? This is what I mean because, again, go back to what I said at the beginning of this teaching about, you know, They'll be the most rewarded in heaven. Why? Because some people have no idea of the work that they are doing, the work that they put in. 
They put timeless powers in there. Timeless powers in there. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The plague has not only begun in this church, but the plague has begun in other churches. The plague has begun in the body of Christ. When you see all of the carnality, there's a carnal plague that has hit the body of Christ that has crept into the church and is parading itself in the, in the church uh, under the guise of Christianity and Christ. And God has nothing to do with it. And people are being swallowed up whole by this plague. Where is the intercessor? I can feel the Spirit of God sometimes in the middle of the night looking for a hungry heart to roll the burden of this person or to roll the burden of that person on. The, who will stand in the gap for this airplane that's about to go down? Who will stand in the gap for uh, these people that's about to be doused with chemical weapons? Who will stand in the gap? Thank you, Lord Jesus. A lot much more of this is going to make sense on Sunday when you come back when we talk about the ages of God. <laughs> Glory to God. Huh, you see how these messages are just room just right? Yeah, it's good stuff. Hallelujah. He says, uh, verse 47, And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation, and behold, the plague was begun among the people, and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. That's intercession. He stood between, listen, here you go. He stood between the dead and the living. He stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. See, one person standing between the dead and the living. Making intercession. One person. One person. That day, I think they said a hundred and... Forty-some thousand people lost their lives before the intercessor could get in place. Wow. You're powerful. As an intercessor, you're powerful. You carry the power with God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so, you know, no wonder our prayer closets and prayer rooms are empty. You know, uh, prayers, you know, which should be the most important service of the church is very not attended very well at all. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And of course, you don't have to be here at church in a season. You can do it at home. But what I'm saying is, you know, uh, one, one chase a thousand, two chase ten thousand, three or four, the whole nation will flee. Well, you know, the, the, the more of us that come together and intercede, the greater. I because like I say, like I say, one of you can stop the plague of God from hitting a nation, then <laughs> think of what two of you can do. Thank you, Lord Jesus. No, I mean, you know, I wish that, you know, that, uh, uh, and, 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 and for going on 11 years, 12 years, we've been up here. You know, uh, 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 if I've set no other example before the people up here, I've set the example of prayer. If I've set no other example, I've set the example of prayer. When people would not even show up and come to a, a prayer night or whatever like that, I'm still there. I'm still praying. And I remember, you know, when we had two, three, four, five that would show up. And I mean, you know, and, and I, I was still there. I was still praying. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And, and I'm telling you, you, you won't find too many churches. Hear me now. And, and this is not destructive. It's supposed to be constructive. But you won't find too many places or churches where the pastor leads the prayer group or where the pastor even shows up to prayer. That's a tragedy. Because I say so often, you know, uh, Without the intercessor, all ministries would fail. All ministries. All ministries would fail. They are dependent upon I'll give you this illustration and I close because we're out of time. Uh, Charles D. Finney, historical fact. The historical fact. Charles G. Finney. They say he got more people saved during his revivals than any other evangelist. Charles G. Finney. They say he would go into whole towns and get whole towns converted to God. They say they have to they have they have to shut down all the beer joints, honky tonks, and grog shop, shops. <laughs> because after Finney left town, everybody was a Christian. Nobody drank anymore, nobody did all of that. So they closed down all the honky tonks and beer joints and all of that stuff. It's a historical fact. They say it was also in a historical fact that more people stayed 
connected to Christ even after he left. You know, because you have uh, uh, some evangelists that come through town, they give an altar call, and they say, well, during the time he was in town, let's say 100,000 people gave their life to Christ. But then about six months later, maybe about 100 or two are living saved. Maybe about a thousand is living saved. But with Charles G. Finney, it was a historical fact that most of his converts stayed true to Christ. Historical fact. But now, Charles G. Finney never took any of the credit for that. There was this little fellow by the name of Father Nash. Y'all really should read up on Charles G. Finney. This little fellow by the name of Father Nash, who you rarely saw him in any of Charles G. Finney's services, but he worked with Charles G. Finney. And he would go ahead of Charles G. Finney two, three, four months ahead of the meeting into a town. He would find two or three or four people and they would enter into what they call a covenant of prayer. They would go off in and rent ho uh, hotel rooms or little bedrooms or whatever. And uh, this one instance, I think it was about four of them, Father Nash and a few others, and they had rented out this room. And, and they would end up moaning and groaning and praying. He said, oftentimes, you know, they would, they would go into these places and pray, and, and they would be all day long praying, all night long praying, and they ate very little. I mean, and they do this up until the time that the meeting is supposed to be there, then they leave there, and then they go to some other town, you know, that, where the, the next meeting is going to be. Well, in a way, where it came to uh, 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 Charles G. Finney, you know, that he had a phone call, and he went and announced the phone, he says, this, uh, Mr. Finney, yeah? She said, do you know a fellow by the name of Father Nash? He said, uh, why? She said, well, because I rented out to my room to them, and uh, it was him and like three other guys. They're in there, they're constantly in there moaning and groaning and crying, and they may not rarely come out for anything. They rarely come out to eat anything. And, 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 and he said, well, uh, don't worry about them. Leave them alone. They're okay. <laughs> you know? What would happen is they would stay in there all day and all night and morning, groan and pray, and, 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 and Charles G. Finney gave them all the credit for all of his conversion and for converting town and stuff like that. He said it, it was these guys right here that entered into a covenant of prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This is why his revivals were so packed with power and so potent with the power of God that people got saved and they stayed saved. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's because of this. And somebody asked him once, they said, well, well, who is this Father Nash fellow? And Finney said, like any man or woman of prayer, they say very little. See? You're a person of prayer. You're not really a gospel. Thank you, Lord Jesus.